Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Godzilla podcast. Well, um, and this is another weekly uh, review of another Godzilla movie. And with regards to this, I tried my best to, I think I was going to finalize, you know, going in a chronological order, but it's the next movie that came up would have been Godzilla Raids again, and it's a hard movie to find the copy of, so I'm still working on that. So I decided to go to the next movie after that in the Godzilla franchise, and that is, of course, the legendary classic King Kong vs. Godzilla. Boy, it had been a while since I'd seen this movie. I think it's probably since I was, I think, either 8 or 9 years old. I've seen snippets of it ever since then, but with regards to the full movie itself, yeah, this was the first time I've probably seen it in decades, so it was a really great way to get refreshed on everything that was within the movie. And wow, what a difference both decades later of experience are, and then also within the Godzilla franchise, what a difference a few years makes when it comes to the tone and the setting of the film. Um, I remember watching it as a kid and thinking to myself, oh my god, this is the greatest movie of all time. And now here, later on in life, and I'm rewatching it, and it's amazing to see just how much is, I mean, there are moments that are good, but there's a lot more moments that are just wrong within this film. And I'm going to go ahead and state it up front that with regards to its rating, I would give it two out of four stars, and that two stars is just barely because of the ending. So anyways, I'll go along with what, uh, you know, the reasons why this movie, I just, and I, and I just finished watching it right now, why this movie is getting such a rating from me. For starters, again, um, the, 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 watching the original Gojira just last week, um, it was amazing how realistic that film was portrayed. Again, I was mentioning that it was more along the lines of a documentary type film. Here, less than a decade later, now Godzilla is, is starting uh, to enter its weird, idiotic, uh, joking type phase where he's more of a cartoon, more of a pun than anything else. And it doesn't help that so much of the movie has scenes that just are just, you could tell this film was wholly detracted from what its original Gojira mode was. And instead, if this was made solely for uh movie generating purposes to make it as family friendly and as kid friendly as possible and um it, you know watching it here now it's amazing to think that wow this is a Godzilla movie that I thought was so good but now it's so different anyways here are the reasons why number 1 um with regards to the weird tone of the movie um can somebody explain what was the deal with those UN reports that kept switching from the U.S. back to Japan, back to uh, some U.N. I guess ship out in outer space, um, where they would look at the camera. So they were straight at the camera, and then some guy would talk about um, how Godzilla, the or origins of Godzilla, the origins of King Kong, uh, the status of Godzilla breaking out of the ice, the status of King Kong being dragged from the island by boat. Uh, could somebody explain like exactly what those were for? Were those exactly as uh, like a way to pretend like the movie was again like a documentary, or was it something along the lines of were they to just be there to inform the audience in a ham-handed way exactly what's going on within the film? It, it was just so weird how the film would switch between what was happening I guess there on the ground and all of a sudden switch to these quote unquote newscasters I don't even know if they were newscasters it sounded like they were some kind of representatives for the UN reporting the news on behalf of the UN but again I don't know I mean it, it was confusing so if somebody could explain like exactly what those were supposed to be then um, you know maybe it would make more sense to me but Every time that the action would switch, uh, like in this case, uh, from going into uh, Kong's island, retrieving Kong, uh, the Godzilla's attack on the trains, and then it would switch back to these UN broadcasters, it was just so weird. I, I just never understood the real reason for it. Um, I did like, though, how Kong was set up from the beginning. Um, very, very reminiscent, of course, of the original King Kong movie 
and it was where these people were going to the island to try to retrieve him and there were hints of him coming uh, with regards to his roar which by the way still remains a classic however that roar was made it is chilling to hear something like that imagine hearing a roar like that out in the wild you would immediately just freeze and wonder exactly what's going on that leads me to another thing that doesn't make sense um, the main company within the film that pharmaceutical company why would their task be in order to drum up more business to retrieve Kong. Uh, was Kong going to sell their pharmaceutical products? Was he going to be a, a mascot for them? I mean, were they going to put him inside of a giant cell of some sort and just have him as an attraction? It just seems so weird that, uh, that this would be the reason why Kong was being retrieved. It seemed very far-fetched um, for something like that to be done. Um, and I'm glad that the film, even in and of itself, realized how absurd that idea was, considering that here we have Japan trying its hardest to keep Godzilla out, and then we have a corporation within Japan trying its hardest to bring a kaiju-like monster in. So it was very, I was very happy to finally see a scene that mean some good sense where uh, uh, Japan's naval forces intercepted the ship carrying Kong, and finally told them, hey, you know, do not bring Kong back onto the island under strict orders. Because, again, it, it just totally contradicts the whole thing that's happening with Godzilla. So I'm glad to see that that was going on on there. But, again, maybe I just didn't get it. But can somebody explain again why the pharmaceutical company, uh, for marketing purposes, was trying to bring back Kong? Um, I did like the haphazard way that they tried to explain, I guess, how Kong was retrieved that red juice that was being used and supposedly it's also the juice that made Kong the size that he is so um, you know in a weird way I can see that happening but either way I mean otherwise the whole plot of trying to retrieve Kong and that weird kooky CEO of the pharmaceutical company it, again it just leads to the kid like tone within the film you would never have seen something like that within the original Gojira film some um, goofball CEO you know, landing on a uh, accidentally on a bomb device and trying to s and accidentally uh, pulling the trigger and, and joking and looking goofy with the glasses and so forth. It, it seemed more like a like a Jerry Lewis type character that was inserted in this film than anything else. So again, it, it just it just led to the weird, unrealistic, kitty like tone within the film. Also, what didn't work within the film. Wow, the special effects just took a huge step down from the original Gojira. At least with Gojira, there was an effort to try to make uh, the film as limited as its budget was. And the effects at the time, at least it took all its best effort it could, it possible to try to make it work. Here, everything was just discarded in favor of really cheap production. I mean, there you had, for example, the miniatures that in the original Gojira looked quite well here in the miniatures you could totally tell I imagine even by uh, those standards back in the 60s that they were miniatures um, and then with regards to the giant octopus that started attacking that hut back on the island yeah, they couldn't even bother to do a large animatronic um, octopus instead it was just uh, octopus itself that was being filmed the same shot back and forth I think I must have seen that shot ten times the one of the the doc, uh, of the octopus's um, air pan, um, hose whatever it breathes with on the side of its neck uh, opening and closing they must have shown that same shot ten times again to try to save money on some regards uh, and then everything else with regards to the film the really really cheap composite shots um, with, uh, you know, the, with the people standing in front of these quote unquote monsters I mean they just look like they were filmed in a different black and white era and just crudely inserted within the picture it, it was just bad pretty bad special effects Kong's suit himself was just uh, I don't know what was going on there was it half finished or something it, it was something where it, I saw patches of fur that just weren't there and I was wondering um, if I guess some of those fur patches of fur just fell off during production and Toho didn't bother just 
uh, putting them back on and then with regards to the um, to the eyes and the mouth the mouth that would just open and the eyes just blink the eyes didn't even bother to move they just crudely just pasted them onto the face itself and then the Godzilla suit um, it surely is one of the worst looking ones I have seen in a while and again with that one the eyes never moved either and it was just the mouth opening back and forth and again it seemed like uh, with regards to this budget that was in the movie so little of it was spent on the suits and oh well I mean I guess uh, Toho did what they did because um, that's the apparently this was still one of the biggest box office uh, successes within Toho Studios history so that would probably no doubt that's why it set the tone afterward throughout the 60s and 70s of having kid friendly kooky Godzilla type movies with him jumping up and down and flying through space and uh, just acting ridiculous because why change it when you had a movie like this that was a huge success but but the suits no I did not like the suits at all the King Kong suit was horrible Godzilla suit was horrible so I just didn't like them at all now here's what did work within the film Again, the whole setup to Kong was worked out really well. I also liked the setup for Godzilla, how he was found trapped within that iceberg. And interestingly enough, I mean, with everything that was happening within the film, uh, there were a lot of directions this film was going. It wasn't until, I think, about the 50-minute mark that we finally got the two of them fight. And with regards to that fight, I did like the fact that they made it somewhat realistic and that Kong would be more intelligent than Godzilla. Uh, Kong would think, Kong would not really strategize but would look at the options available and the first time that Godzilla blasted fire at him he would be intelligent enough to recognize that you know maybe just a full frontal assault wouldn't work out so he decided to of course retreat at that time I like that that was in there and I also like Kong's character uh, within the film he was a scrappy little fighter he was one that uh, I like how they made him completely opposite from Godzilla. Godzilla is slow and lumbering. Every single attack can take a couple of moments. Kong uh, would just run, get up and run at it. Um, every time Godzilla swiped him down, um, he would immediately just scrap back up and just run back immediately. They made him like a Rocky Balboa type of of kaiju monsters here was one guy that um, no matter what was happening it was always getting back up and charging against Godzilla again and of course he was using his surroundings uh, with regards to the giant rocks and the trees um, to use that to his advantage and that's what leads me to give it the two stars within the film and when they finally 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 met one more time towards the end of the film and this was the major brawl I loved it that you know they brought him on and he crash landed towards Godzilla. I didn't like the ridiculous notion that, oh wow, all of a sudden the army has all these balloons ready to carry a kaiju. Again, it makes you wonder um, how much serious thought was placed into the storyline. Seriously, you know, what kind of country would have giant balloons ready to carry a kaiju? And with regards to the wire, that steel wire that was cameoed at the beginning of the film, um, the guy that was saying, you know, this wire is stronger than steel itself. All of a sudden, there's a huge surplus of it available to carry Kong. Uh, my understanding was that this that was like a prototype of some sort, and he only had a small amount. But all of a sudden, there's enough to there's thousands of yards available. Again, you know, it just seemed kind of uh, too easy. One of those uh, Deus Ex Machina type things where it was too easily explained to get Kong over to Godzilla. But anyways. Once he crash landed, um, and he you know uh, slid down that rock and uh, crash landed into Godzilla, and the fight was on. That's when it got good, and that's when I felt that the movie really, really picked up. And again, I really loved seeing how Kong was just a no holds barred scrap MMA type fighter. I mean, he would just charge and charge and charge, and never give up. Um, it was weird to see that Kong was apparently available to accept electricity but what well, he used it to his advantage and he brought Godzilla down so anyways again this film I would give it two out of four stars two stars lost for the ridiculousness within the film um, everything that I mentioned and, and I haven't even talked about the dubbing how it seems to be the worst one within the films that I've seen yet in Godzilla special effects horrible the storyline just was too kid friendly the broadcast I have no idea but two stars extra because of the giant monster attacks. Those were pretty good, and I did like Kong's character. 
So, as always, thanks again, everybody. Take care.